happy Sabbath to everyone. It's um, a privilege to be here this morning. I um, haven't been here that often in the recent decades, um, but as a child when I would come up to my grandparents' farm um, and stay with them from about the uh, age of five, I think my first trip to stay with them for a few weeks, I can remember coming to church here every Sabbath and um, I was sitting here and thinking, Man, I used to think the Wangarei Church was huge. <laughs> it's interesting the perspective you have as a little person as you grow up, everything shrinks in size when you see it again. Well, um, I live in California with my wife, Irenea. She is not able to be here. Um, she had a rough night last night. She stayed up worrying about my sister and um, who had a turn, very bad turn yesterday and went to hospital. and. And uh, so she didn't feel up to coming. But anyway, um, God is good to us and my sister's fine. Um, but this morning, before I get into the message, I'll just uh, share a little bit of what I'm doing and, and what I'm involved in. Um, I live in California and work at Weimar Institute. How many of you have heard of Weimar Institute? Quite a lot of you have heard of Weimar. Um, Weimar Institute was established in around the 19, late 1970s. It was established um, by a, quite a large group of lay people who uh, had a burden to see uh, educational reform and to see us get back to the Spirit of Prophecies Council in how to um, reach our cities and so forth. And so a property was sought out and bought and um, since then the New Start program, many of you are familiar with the New Start program, has been running there, has been very effective in helping a lot of people uh, find their way back to health. Um, we've seen m amazing miracles actually and we've also seen many conversions. People come there and they come in contact with God who is the true healer and um, as they experience that healing they realize that they're loved and they realize that, that uh, God really wants a relationship with them and to save them. And so we've seen even Muslims uh, converted as a result of going through the New Start program. It's a powerful way of reaching people, the health message. Well, I was a pastor in Michigan for seven years and um, then we got a call to go to Weimar and we've been there, we're in our seventh year now. and. Um, the Lord has been leading me in, in various ways, and it's interesting, very interesting how he leads, but um, for the last three years I've been managing the farm at Weimar. It's an organic farm, has about 25 acres of uh, fruits and vegetables, and um, the Lord has been opening my eyes more and more to just the amazing power of nature to reveal who he is, to reveal his love, and, and just uh, clear all those lies in people's minds about what kind of a God he is. And um, so I'm going to share a little bit with you through the message of, about uh, nature and, and how you can take hold of it too and um, use it as not only inspirational um, benefit to your own life but also to share with other people because we have our work to do, amen? We have a work to share the gospel, the three angels' messages, with uh, all the people in our community and all around the world. Jesus said this gospel will go to the, the entire world and then the end will come. And um, we've still got a lot to do. There's still a lot of people that don't know about God. And we want to use every resource that God has given us to accomplish this task because this world is not our home. As beautiful as this country is and as beautiful as the properties that we live on and, and just living a self-sufficient life and enjoying these blessings, this is not our home. This world is filled with curses, amen? And we, we have to put up with this. And even if we live to a ripe old age, the curse of sin takes its toll and, and aging takes us down humbly to the grave. This world is not our home. God has a much better place for us, and I hope that each one of you keep that in mind every day that you live, preparing for that wonderful time when Jesus is going to come in the clouds of heaven to take us home. Well, I could uh, say more, but if I do, the clock will strike 12, and your stomach will strike 12, and, and I'll lose your, your uh, focus. So let's get into this. Before I do, I'd like to pray, so if you'd bow your heads with me. 
Loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege it is to be here today and to worship you, the only God, the only one who can save us, and the only one who really, truly loves us. And Father, we, we thank you for the privilege of coming here to, to offer our praise and to focus our minds and hearts on you. Father, as we listen to uh, your word and your inspiration this morning, Lord, I want to get out of the way and I pray that you will help me in that so that you can be seen and heard. And um, Father, speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit and show us how we can have a closer walk with you and how we can be more effective in our work of sharing who you are with others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message is Nature Speaks. And God has been revealing to me, as I mentioned, how powerful nature is. I was a student missionary in Lithuania uh, way back in 1994. And while I was there, I uh, was amazed to see several things, and I won't go into all the detail because of time, but there was a lady there, a newly converted person, who just loved the Lord, who was um, just on fire and just could not hold back the joy that she had and the hope that she had. And this lady would go around sharing with people everywhere on the street. She'd go to places like the prisons, to old age homes, rest homes, and share with people there. I remember one time going with her to this place, and um, there was this Catholic chapel in this rest home, and 94% um, of the population of Lithuania is uh, Catholic, or it was back then, and um, sh there were people in there, you know, worshiping these idols and pictures on the walls, and she went in there and she started talking to them, and then as she was talking to them, um, they started to gather around and wanting to hear what she had to say. So she came up to the front where the priest would normally be offering the mass and so forth, and they all took their seat in this little chapel, and she preached for a solid hour with no notes, just preached her heart out of, of the goodness of God and how they could, don't, you don't need to pray through this idol, you can go directly yourself, you don't need a priest, you can pray directly to God. And it was just amazing to see this lady on fire for the Lord, and I, I believe that what I saw in her life was a little glimpse of what it's going to be like when the latter rain is poured out and under the power of the Holy Spirit, the gospel message is going to go rapidly to the whole world. And what a day that's going to be. And I believe we need to prepare for that day to be recipients of that because we're told if we don't prepare for that, that it can be falling all around us and we won't recognize it. We'll, in fact, we'll call it fanaticism. Um, so... Anyway, this lady kept me so busy the entire six months that I was there in Lithuania because she was making contacts with people that wanted to study the Bible after she witnessed to them. And she said, Darren, you need to go and study with this person and with this person. I was running around. I couldn't keep up with studying with all the people that she was making contact with. Well, in this rest home that she took me to, there were two men who were dying. Well, no, not dying. One of them was dying of cancer. He wasn't that old. He was probably in his 50s. There was another man who had been in the war in Afghanistan and had had his legs blown off. He had no legs, and so he was in this rest home, and that's where he was taken care of. Well, she said, you've got to go in and talk to these two men because they won't listen to me. Every time I go in and try to witness to them, they make sexual remarks to me because I'm a woman. And, and she said, you're a man. You can reach them. Go in there and talk to them. So I said, okay, I'll go and talk to them. Well, I went in and I talked to them. And these two men, they basically said to me, we are atheists. We were raised that way. We do not believe in God. We don't want to talk about God. You know, don't go there. So I thought, okay, let me just make friends of these guys. So I started to just talk to them in general and visit with them. Well, I went week, week after week. I had to travel on a bus to get there about an hour out of the city. And um, so I went several weeks in a row, and um, still the door wouldn't open. I gave them a step to Christ. So I said, just read this book. And they uh, didn't want to read the book, and they put it down, and I said, just keep it. You know, they wanted to give it back to me, and I said, keep it. One day you'll read it. And uh, so anyway, these men, um, week after week, the, the book sat there on their shelf. They didn't touch it. But one week, 
they said to me, and this was just at the end of my time there, they said to me, we just saw a television program that was on New Zealand. And they said, what a beautiful country New Zealand is. What on earth are you doing in this terrible part of the world? Why aren't you back there? And I said to them, I said, the reason that I am th not there, I'd, I'd much rather be there. It's a beautiful country and I'd, I would love to be there. But I said, God has a much more beautiful country than that that he's preparing for us. And I've come here to tell you about it. And they went completely silent. They didn't say a word. They just sat there. And uh, we talked a little bit. So I left after visiting with them for a little while. And I went back the next week. It was my last week. And I went to say goodbye to them, thinking that I'd had no uh, open door to reach them. Well, you would never guess what happened the next week. I walk into the room where they used to, to be. There was only one man there, the man who was dying from cancer. His family were there visiting. I don't know how much longer he had to live, but they were visiting him, and he said to me, look, I can't visit with you now because my family are here visiting. But he said, I want you to know I read the book and I believe. And that's what he said to me. I thought, wow, praise God. Praise God. You know, He read it. He's no longer an atheist. He believes in God. And he learned all about Jesus, our Savior. And he, obviously, if he believes, he's accepted Jesus. And I, w I went out of that room just full of joy. And he said, look, the other guy, Romanus, who was my roommate, he has been moved to another room. And he said, he told me where to go. So I went and found him. I went in there. He was in this room by himself. And though he had no legs, they'd been cut off completely. He was sitting on his bed there. And when I walked in the room and he saw me, he was so excited he was jumping up and down with his little stubby legs on the bed, so excited to see me. And he said to me, I read the book, and I believe it, and I want to get a Bible, and I'm going to read the Bible. And he was just excited about what he had learned. And we had a wonderful time of visiting there. I said goodbye, and that's the last time I've seen them. And I believe I will see those two men in the kingdom. But you know, the reason why they believed and they changed their position from being atheists to believing in the living God was because they saw a beautiful picture of New Zealand, God's creation, and they, it, it, it gave them a picture of who God is. God created these things to bless us, to make us happy, to reveal his love. And uh, so he, uh, these men saw a picture of God that drew them to him, and they wanted to know him. How powerful nature is. In the book Steps to Christ, the very opening um, paragraph says, Nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. Our Father in heaven is the source of life, of wisdom, and of joy. Look at the wonderful and beautiful things of nature. Think of their marvelous adaptation to the needs and happiness, not only of man, but of all living creatures the sunshine and the rain that gladden and refresh the earth, the hills and the seas and plains, all speak to us of the Creator's love. It is God who supplies the daily needs of all his creatures. Can you imagine, just put yourself in that mindset of being an atheist and reading about this, having this beautiful picture that they just saw of creation and thinking, wow, this is true. This is true, and I'm sure the Holy Spirit was telling them it was true. And as they read on, a couple of paragraphs down, it carried on and said, God is love. It's written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass, the lovely birds mocking, making their air, the air vocal with their happy songs, the delicately tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest with their rich foliage, or... Sorry, I'm going to have to put my glasses on. Um, of living green, all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. Do you believe that? Do you believe God desires to make you happy, to make you happy in your life? He loves to make us happy, and all these beautiful things he created were to make us happy. The Bible says this, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
You know, if we are thoughtful when we're out in nature, if we start thinking about who is the author, who is the one who made these things, who is the mastermind that made all these things that work so beautifully together, we get a, a picture of who he is. On the farm back at Weimar, as an organic farm, you just can't pull out the chemicals and spray out the weeds and spray the bugs and things like that. You have to look at other means and um, you have to basically try to work in harmony with nature as much as possible. And so one of the things I read up about was that there are different birds that can help you with the job of eating the bugs. And so bluebirds were one of the uh, birds that um, we found uh, would eat a lot of bugs. And they are amazing. They eat a lot of bugs. They are busy all day long flying around finding bugs and taking them back to their nests. So what we did was we put up nests all around the farm in different places so that they would find the nests and move in. And surely, sure enough, they moved into every single one of those nests. And um, one morning, it was um, about uh, probably 5.30ish, I was up at the farm. It's so stinking hot during the summertime that you have to get up early in the morning to beat the heat and get some work done. So I was up there and it was, the, lo the sun was just coming up but I could barely see anything. It was, you know, it was just the break of day. And um, I was getting ready to go to work and there was uh, someone else who had turned up there to, to work with me. And I was looking up at this, um, this nest that was on the side of the shed. And when I looked up there, I thought, I looked at the hole where they normally go into their nest. I thought, wow. The wasps have gone and made a nest right in the doorway of that, and there are some babies inside there. And um, I thought, I've got to knock down that wasp nest. So I went and got a long pole, and I reached up there, and I was, I, I'm pushing this nest and trying to, to break this wasp nest. You know, it was usually stuck on by one little thing at the top and break it off. It wouldn't move. I'm, I'm poking and poking and poking away at this thing. It stayed right there. And as I, was, I kept working, I don't know how long I worked on it, it might have been 10 minutes. The sun was coming up more and more, and it got lighter and lighter. And as I looked up there at that hole, it got light enough that I could see it wasn't a wasp's nest. It was the belly of the father bird that had pinned itself to the entrance of that nest to stop any predator coming in there and getting his little babies. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I poked that thing so hard, you wouldn't believe it, and it wouldn't come off. That bird was hanging on there for its dear life, protecting its young ones. What a beautiful picture of our Father in heaven, you know, who watches over us day by day. All of creation, if we look at it um, carefully, we will find attributes of our Father's love for us. It's just absolutely amazing. Notice this, uh, this statement here. In their original perfection, all created things were an expression of the thought of God. To Adam and Eve in their Eden home, nature was full of the knowledge of God, teeming with divine instruction. Wisdom spoke to the eye and was received into the heart, for they communed with God in his created works. As soon as the holy pair transgressed the law of the Most High, the brightness from the face of God departed from the face of of nature. We can't begin to imagine how beautiful and awesome the original creation untainted by sin was, but I, yeah, I can't wait to see it again. Well, again, I haven't seen it yet, but I can't wait to, to see it when God recreates it again. And, um, you know, it's interesting here that it says that the brightness from the face of God was over all of creation. I, know, I remember that Adam and Eve were clothed with light you know, and that was their clothing. They didn't have clothing like we have to cover their nakedness. It was light. But here, nature was covered with light from God. And everything that they looked at revealed to them something about God. And as they looked at that, they had some kind of communication. I don't know. Obviously, nature was communicating to them about who God was. And somehow they were responding and communicating back. Maybe it was just joining in with the birds and singing praise to God. Wow, how awesome he is. I don't know, but they communed through nature. But after the fall, we're told here in, in uh, this statement that although the earth was blighted with the curse, nature was still to be man's lesson book. It could not now represent goodness only, for evil was everywhere present. 
marring earth and sea and air with its defiling touch. Where once was written only the character of God, the knowledge of good, was now written also the character of Satan, the knowledge of evil. From nature, which now revealed the knowledge of good and evil, man was continually to receive warning as to the results of sin. We see the effects of sin, don't we? We see things dying. We see thorns and thistles and weeds and all kinds of things. Everything has been touched by the enemy. And it's interesting that in the Bible, in Genesis 3:17 to 19, after the... Um, fall of Adam and Eve, God speaking to Adam said, because you've heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for whose sake? For your sake. Now if something is for your sake, is that to be a curse or is that to be a blessing? When God says it's for your sake, is it a curse or a blessing? It's a blessing, even though it's a curse. How does that work? Well, it's interesting. He says, In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The hardship of life, dealing with this curse, God intended to teach us valuable lessons. And it's interesting that we are told, I, didn't, I don't believe I included in here, that um, there's a statement of Spirit of Prophecy that says that God intended through the toil that would come from dealing with the, the curse of, of weeds and thorns and thistles and so forth, that that was a part of God's plan to um, basically to redeem us. It was part of his plan to restore what was lost in the fall. Our characters are far from re revealing the character of God. And when we deal with the, the, the hardships of life, when we work with God to remove the evil, then there's a lesson that we learn and it builds our characters. I don't have time to develop that further, but I will share this with you, that um, these weeds and thistles, we are told that not one noxious plant was placed in the Lord's great garden. But after Adam and Eve sinned, poisonous herbs sprang up. In the parable of the sower, the question was asked the master, Did not thou sow good seed in thy field? How then hath it tears? The master answered, An enemy has done this. All tears are sown by the evil one. Notice this statement. Every noxious herb is of his sowing, and by his ingenious methods of amalgamation, he has corrupted the earth with tears. I find that fascinating, that word amalgamation. What's going on in the world today? You heard of GMO seeds, right? The genetic modification, putting foreign things into the DNA of seed and, and animals, creatures. I wonder if Satan wasn't the originator of that way back, this amalgamation, that he somehow, wanting to have the position of Jesus, the creator, Somehow, when he gained control of this world, the being the ruler of this world, that he started playing with creation, thinking he could improve on it, or I don't know what his intent would be, but somehow he started mixing and came up with these noxious weeds that we have to deal with. I don't know, that's just me thinking. But somehow, he created these things. The animals as well, that's right. Well, at Weimar, after reading that, uh, I decided that um, if these noxious weeds are from Satan, I need to get rid of them. I don't want to tolerate them. In the, and, and the Lord just impressed me. Get rid of them. So as we, um, as we started uh, growing in this valley here, it's interesting that in this valley it was full of blackberry and weeds and it hadn't been grown in for, for decades and um, it was really just a mess. And so we went through and cut it all out and ripped up, all, tried to get the uh, um, roots of the blackberry out of the ground and so on. Anyway, we planted crops there this last year for the first time. And um, 
We've worked really hard with students there, hand weeding this. We're not using any chemical sprays or anything to weed it. And you know, this man who um, was very familiar with Weimar, had been around for quite a long time, he came to me one day and he said, he said, you know, this valley used to be just full of weeds and, and, and blackberry and all of that. And he said, this is absolutely amazing. He said, now it looks like the Garden of Eden. He was so impressed with what, you know, seeing the beauty of creation. And I believe that God wants us to cooperate with him to remove the curse so that we can reveal how beautiful his creation is uh, when we, you know, remove the curse of what Satan has, um, has brought into this world through his amalgamation and so forth. We are told here in this statement that through the creation, we are to become acquainted with the creator. The book of nature is a great lesson book, which in connection with the scriptures, we are to use in teaching others of his character and guiding lost sheep back to the fold of God. I want you to capture that. I don't want to pass over it uh, lightly. It's to teach others of his character and guide lost sheep back to the fold of God. As the works of God are studied, the Holy Spirit flashes conviction into the mind, a deeper meaning is grasped, and the sublime spiritual truths of the written word are impressed on the heart. I was flying recently from uh, Chicago to Nashville, and as I was flying there, you know, I really enjoy flying because the Lord always surprises me with divine appointments. Not every flight, but sometimes. And... Um, this particular time, I was sitting next to a gentleman, and um, I started getting acquainted with him for the duration of the less than two-hour flight. And um, he was a um, cardiologist. He worked at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, and he was he was um, a lecturer and taught there. And he was on his way back from England, where he'd been giving lectures. And so this man was very intellectual, and I was thinking, well, I'm not very intellectual. Um, I'm not sure how I can witness to this man. Um, but anyway, I was available to the Lord if he wanted to use me, and so I was silently praying that the Lord would give me an open door to witness. And um, so I talked to him about his family and his occupation, and and uh, then I thought, you know, now I need to just see and throw out some bait and just see if he's got any interest at all in religious things. And uh, sometimes when you're in conversation with somebody, you listen to what they're saying and you can take something of what they're saying and then insert something, you know, to, to turn the conversation to religious things. Well, one thing he had told me was that he had moved a number of years ago from New England in the United States down there to Nashville. Now, Nashville, if you don't know, uh, is part of what they call the Bible Belt. And the Bible Belt is a huge uh, Baptist stronghold, and uh, every corner seems to have a Baptist church or some church on it. And, and um, so I just threw it out to him, and I said, well, how do you like living in the Bible Belt? And um, he said to me, well, he said, I'm a staunch atheist. And he said, um, not an atheist, sorry, a, a staunch agnostic. And he said, uh, well, he said, I've got the secretary who's one of those Jesus people. And she's always leaving little, little things on my desk about Jesus. And, you know, I just kind of throw them away and, and that. But he said, she's a really nice person. But he said, I'm not interested. And then he started to tell me that he was raised Southern Baptist. And he said, you know, being raised Southern Baptist, um, you know, I could see through all of the um, falseness, you know, of, of what, they, what they tried to push us kids into. He said, you know, um, the pastor would get paid more money if he got more baptisms. And so he corralled all of us kids into a class, and then he told us about hell and how we we're going to burn in hell if we didn't accept Jesus, and he urged us to get baptized. Well, he said, I could see through all of that. And he said the other thing was, he said... Um, he said, um, I love to dance. And he said, um, I feel like I was created to dance. I just love it. And he said, um, you know, the church for, used to forbid that. And he said, um, you know, I just, I just didn't want to have part of the church. 
And so I'm thinking about this, and, and uh, I know it's not good to argue with people. You're not going to win them through arguing or even giving them you know, persuasive uh, um, intellectual reasons why it's not good to dance or, or, any, or anything else like that. And so I started to talk to him a little bit um, about what I'm involved in, and I started sharing my testimony briefly about how God um, converted me from being a... Uh, pretty wayward young man to um, give my life to Jesus and I said you know now I'm, I'm farming and I work in cooperation with the Creator and uh, the more I see of his work in nature and see how beautiful and harmonious cre uh, creation is I said I, the more I see that I'm drawn to him I, I really like who he is and um, and you know he made this comment he said yeah I enjoy nature too and he was thinking about it and uh, so I, I talked to him a little bit more and I said, you know what you mentioned about hellfire? I said the Bible has two different pictures that it gives of hell. One is that it's burning eternally and the other is that uh, the fire goes out. And um, I didn't try to persuade him that the eternal burning hellfire was wrong, but I said I believe that the, the hellfire that b goes out and, and destroys the wicked and they're no more is consistent with the character of God, a God who loves us and he gets no pleasure out of the wicked suffering. And so I just made that comment to him. And then I pulled out a Steps to Christ book out of my briefcase, and I, um, I, I said, you know, this, this little book here has been a wonderful blessing to me, and it's really helped me understand God, and I, 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 it's, it's really helped me in my relationship with God. I still had it in my hand. I hadn't offered it to him to read. And while I was explaining to him about the book, he reached across, he took it out of my hands, he started looking through it, and he started looking at all the chapter titles and, and came through, and there was one that said, What to Do with Doubt. And when he came to that one, he said, This looks like an interesting book. He said, I do have a lot of doubt. And, uh, and then he said, uh, do you have any extra copies? I would like one. And I said, yes, I do. You're welcome to have this. And so uh, he thanked me. And then we, we talked on a little bit. And he said, you know, my wife was raised in a religious home. And she's made comments to me periodically that we should go to church. And um, he said, uh, she's going to be really happy when I come home with this book and we read it together. And I thought, wow, praise God. I had no clue that I could reach this intellectual man with anything that would stimulate his mind to think of God. All I did was share about the beauty of nature and how I am drawn to it and how I love God. And uh, it drew him too. It was powerful. And so I praise God that he is opening um, doors through nature to reach people. That's why I'm sharing it with you. I hope you'll take it up and, and go and share it with others too. We are told this, that in the natural world, God has placed in the hands of the children of men the key. What is a key for? To unlock the treasure house of his word. So nature needs to be combined with the Bible. We need to study the Bible and study nature, and nature will help us to understand the word more clearly. Um, it goes on and says, The unseen is illustrated by the seen. Divine wisdom, eternal truth, infinite grace are understood by the things that God has made. To those who thus acquaint himself, themselves with Christ, the earth will never more be a lonely and desolate place. It will be their father's house filled with the presence of him who once dwelt among men. It sounds like the cure for depression to me. I must move on because time is running away. When the Lord was training Israel, this is very fascinating to me. Notice this. When the Lord was doing what? Training. Do we need training? We do, right? To do the Lord's work, we need training. Do you ever feel ill-equipped to share the gospel message? Do you feel like you lack the tools? Listen to this. When the Lord was training Israel to be what? Special representatives of who? of himself, notice what he did when he was going to offer them training. He gave them homes among the hills and valleys. In their home life and their religious service, they were brought in constant contact with nature and with the word of God. So Christ taught his disciples by the lake. 
on the mountainside, in the fields and groves, where they could look upon the things of nature by which he illustrated his teachings. Do you get it? Do you see what's being said there? That nature illustrates the teachings of God, and that was what he chose for the children of Israel in order for them to be trained to be his representatives. I hope you catch, catch that important part. I'm going to speed on here. Men were to cooperate with God. This is also talking about the children of Israel. In restoring the diseased land to health, that it might be a praise and a glory to his name. And as the land they possessed would, if managed with skill and earnestness, produce its treasures, so their hearts, if controlled by God, would reflect his character. In the laws which God gave for the cultivation of the soil, he was giving the people opportunity to overcome their selfishness. Now, I don't know about you. I need to overcome my selfishness. Um, but God has given us a means here. And to become heavenly minded. Canaan would be to them as Eden if they obeyed the word of the Lord. Through them, the Lord designed to teach, capture this part, he designed that through, the, that through them, the Lord designed to teach all the nations of the world how to cultivate the soil so that it would yield healthy fruit free from disease. The earth is the Lord's vineyard and is to be treated according to his plan those who cultivated the soil were to realize they were doing God's service. They were as truly in their lot and place as were men appointed to minister in the priesthood and in work connected with the tabernacle. That just blew me away when I read that. They were as much doing the work of God as those who were priests offering the sacrifices, teaching people about God and... Um, representing him there that's that's absolutely fascinating notice this in the book of ezekiel 48 18 and 19 this model that was given for the sanctuary that never got built because the children of israel were too content with staying in babylon and only a few moved out and went back when they were able and so this plan was never really uh, was never implemented but in this plan for the new temple and for the layout of the new of the jerusalem it's very fascinating that it says here that right next to where the temple was, there was going to be a farm. And I did a rough calculation of the size of this farm, and it was a, roughly about 6,000 acres. That's a pretty big farm. And it says here that the workers of the city from all the tribes of Israel were to cultivate it. So that meant nobody was exempt. That meant that the Levites who worked in the temple were also to be part of a big collective group that were cultivating this ground because what we just learned, that it was God, part of God's training so that they could be representatives of his character and they needed the work that the farm would offer them to be his representatives and to to share the knowledge of him with the nations around them. Unfortunately, they didn't follow this plan and it was never implemented. But notice this, that when Jesus came to this earth, God had the same plan for Jesus to learn about his father through nature. It says here that his intimate acquaintance with the scriptures shows how diligently his early years were given to the study of God's word. And spread out before him was the great library of God's created works. It wasn't just a book. Sometimes we refer to it as the book of nature. It was a library full of books. He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in the earth and sea and sky. Apart from the unholy ways of the world, he gathered stores of scientific knowledge from nature. He studied the life of plants and animals and the life of man. From his earliest years, he was possessed of one purpose. He lived to bless others. For this, he found resources in nature. New ideas of ways and means flashed into his mind as he studied plant life and animal life. Thus, to Jesus, the significance of the word and works of God was unfolding. Notice what happened as he did this. And as he was trying to understand the reason of things, Heavenly beings were his attendants. I believe that if we will thoughtfully look at nature and, and look to understand God, 
that heavenly beings will draw near to us as well and teach us these valuable lessons that will benefit us in this life and in our work of representing his character. Sorry, I have to speed on. In these lessons direct from nature, there is a simplicity and purity that makes them of the, how, what kind of value? Highest, Highest value. All need the teaching to be derived from this source. In itself, the beauty of nature leads the soul away from sin and worldly attractions and toward purity, peace, and God. In the Psalms, it says, The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. I might skip over this, but I will point out that in the sacrificial system, the lamb that pointed everyone to Jesus... God chose this little creature, the lamb, to represent himself. And the Bible says that like a sheep before its shearers was dumb, so he opened not his mouth as he was going to the slaughter when he died on the cross. But we are told here in Scripture that as Noah came out of the ark with his family, I'm not sure where his wife is in this picture, but I'm sure she was around. But as he came out and offered up a sacrifice of the one of each of the clean animals that his faith was in the fact that this lamb or these creatures represented his redeemer and he knew his life was saved from that terrible destruction of the flood because of the substitute that would come into this world and take his place as a sinner and redeem him he had faith in that he knew that was the reality and out of gratitude in his heart, even though he came out of that ark and everything was devastated, there probably wasn't hardly a green thing on the world left. It was ugly and, and ruined. And, you know, we would be depressed if we had come from a beautiful world and then we saw what we were going to live in. But his heart was still filled with praise to God. And it says here that the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Now, I, I had to think about this a little bit. Because I don't think God gets any pleasure out of smelling burnt flesh. I don't think he, he uh, I mean, I, if I smell a barbecue, you know, it does smell nice. But uh, for God, I don't believe that he eats meat. And I don't think that it uh, does anything for him to smell burning flesh. But it says he smelled a soothing aroma. Now, if you get back into the original language um, where the soothing aroma comes from. It can also be translated is, as that God perceived that he was properly restful. It can be, it's just a difficult way of uh, translating it, but the, the original words actually mean that. So when God looked down at Noah, who had faith in the substitutional sacrifice representing Jesus, he could see that Noah was properly restful in that provision that had been made. And I want to ask you today, are you properly restful in the provisions that God has made for your salvation? Do you have the assurance that Jesus has paid the price for your sins completely, 100%? That there's nothing that you can do to atone for your sins? You know, it's hard for us as Adventists to come to that realization because we believe in sanctification, amen? We believe that God is working in our lives to prepare us to live in heaven. And so we are easily diverted from the focus on gratitude, on the sacrifice made for us, to a life of conforming our lives to the will of God. And we've got to do this and we've got to do that. Otherwise, we're going to be lost. And so we very easily lose focus on this. But the reality is that if we will focus and express our gratitude every day in the provisions that God has made for us, thank him that the price is paid, thank him for the gift of life that he's given us, and, and live our lives gratefully. You know, sanctification just happens naturally out of that kind of an approach to life. We have to cooperate with God, and we, we seek to, to do what's pleasing, but there's joy in our hearts to do it. There's a, there's a pleasure in serving the Lord, not a, I've got to do this, and a long face and a, you know, and a fear. No, God wants us to be joyful. Well, I could preach a whole sermon on that. And I, I don't intend to do that. I'm wrapping it up now. But I want to point out a beautiful illustration that we are surrounded with here in New Zealand with the sheep. Nearly everywhere you go, you'll see sheep on the hillsides. 
And um, this was one of the animals that God had used as a representation of Jesus. And as I thought about sheep and lambs and, and so forth, I can remember watching these little lambs and, you know, they're so innocent. And as a kid, I had, you know, the joy of raising a, an orphaned lamb. And, you know, they are just purely innocent. They really are. They, they're harmless. They won't, they won't do a thing to you to bite you or butt you or do anything else like some critters will. But um, anyway, in these, in these little uh, lambs, there's an illustration of what Jesus is doing for us through his sacrifice that I believe is powerful in helping us understand the gospel message. I remember on our farm in, in Nauarua that oftentimes there was a ewe that would die when it was giving birth for some reason. And a lamb was left as an orphan and I remember that uh, the farm manager would go around on his horse at lambing time and look and find these orphans and he would pick them up and carry them with him and then periodically he would find a dead lamb that died at, at uh, birth and some of you who have a farming background know what the shepherd would do. He would get off his horse and pick up that dead lamb and he would take a knife and he would skin that lamb and peel that skin off and then he would take that lamb that was orphaned and he'd make a coat out of, that, uh, out of that skin and put it on that lamb. And as soon as he put it on that lamb, that lamb who was orphaned and had been hungry and bleating and crying out and going and trying every ewe to get a drink and the ewe would turn around and shove it away and say, no, you're not mine. This little lamb that was destined to die now had a coat on it that would enable it to be adopted to a new mother. And as that little lamb continued to go around and as that ewe that was bleating and, and heartbroken over its dead son or, or daughter or whatever, um, the uh, little lamb would eventually meet up with this mother who lost its, its child and it would be adopted into the family. What a beautiful illustration of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Jesus, when he died on the cross, not only paid the price for our sins, but he has given us the gift of righteousness. He has given us his coat to put on so that we can be adopted. We are not acceptable in God's sight without that robe of righteousness on. We cannot be adopted into his family without that. What a beautiful and powerful illustration that God has given us of his love for us. We can wear the skin of Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you have put on that skin and how many of you desire to be adopted through the means and provisions that God has made? I'm, I'm raising my hand because I, I'd like to see a response of, of faith that we really truly believe and we praise God for it. You know, we have been given the task of taking the three angels messages to the entire world. And while the message is going out and we are making efforts, I believe that as we focus on the first angel's message, that is to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water, the focus is pointing to the creator, the creator of all these beautiful things in nature that he designed to bless us. And he designed that we would be trained by them and that we would use nature as a means of revealing his character so that others would fall in love with him and understand the gospel message and come to him and be adopted as children as we have been today. How many of you want to say thank you, Lord, for giving us this provision? And today I see with renewed focus that this is a wonderful way of witnessing for the Lord. How many of you want to unite with the Lord, being trained and being witnesses to share with others? How many of you? I just, I'm asking for a show of hands. Praise God. And uh, I will end the message with that. And I pray that God will continue to train each one of us that we can be effective in his work. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you that um, we have a wonderful Savior. We believe that um, we are truly loved when we look to the cross and see what an amazing price has been paid for us. 
we are so unworthy and we are um, still filled with um, many faults and, and problems and we're still messed up, Lord, in this life. But we want to keep our eyes on Jesus day by day and thank you for that coat that it makes us adopted into your family. And as we drink the milk of your word and as we digest the food that you've given us, we know that we will grow up to look like you, to uh, represent you and to be able to share with others what an amazing father you are. We pray that you will bless this church and the the evangelistic um, mission that you've given this church. I pray for the pastor, Pastor Adrian, for the elders and for the leaders, everyone who has been um, elected to office to carry on this work right here in Wangarei. Please bless them and um, pour out your spirit and reach everyone possible in this area so that when the end comes, we know it's not far away, that there will be no one lost who may have been redeemable by our diligent effort. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a wonder of sunset at evening The wondrous sunrise I see But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul Is a wonder that God loves me Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. There's the wonder of springtime and harvest The sky, the stars, the sun But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul Is a wonder that's only begun Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me. Dear Father in heaven, as we leave your place of worship, we pray for your blessing to go with us, not only through the remainder of the Sabbath day, but through the week to come. And may you bring us all back next week filled with joy as we are focused on your goodness and mercy and love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>